proper camera here. Why is it off? Nice picture. It's different from the past. Okay. Yeah. I I'm confused why my camera is not on, but let me see what I can do. If you have a different app that used a camera, that can do it. So if you have Teams on or something. Yeah. I, I'm confused. Um, I'm a building, but there's no, my camera is not working. Why not? Uh, are any of my cameras working? Oh. Huh. Okay. There you are. Well, my laptop, my laptop is working, but that's not what I look at. Let me see if I can get. And here is Grover. Welcome. <clears throat> well, we do see you, Gaston. Okay. So. All right. Well, um, I'll leave that for now until I get my other camera set up. Hi, Grover. Hi, everyone. Hey, Grover. Hi. Waiting for one more for quorum. Yeah, I don't. I haven't heard from anybody that they're not coming except for uh, um, Paul. I mean, I didn't hear from him, but I'm he's on vacation or he's taking time off, so I don't expect him at all. And here is Rob. Welcome, Rob. So it's 7.01. We, as soon as Gaston comes back, at least. Oh, yeah, I'm here. OK. So we have five people, so we can start if we want, or maybe we'll wait a couple minutes and see if <clears throat> Allegra comes. Nate is in the audience. And uh, Nate is there. Shall we bring yeah. him into the room? Greg, did he say anything to you? He's in his um, car. No, I think he's, stand, he, so. he's driving, so I think I think he's preferred to sort of be uh, um, on in audio for now. So we'll, okay. uh, we'll boost him if, he, well, if you'd like to join. Nate, if you can hear us, we're going to leave you as an attendee. If you want to come into the room, if you have a way to raise your hand or something or other, do it or else we'll just bring you in the room whether you like it or not if we need you <laughs> hello allegra hello <clears throat> so here we are i'm uh, calling a meeting to order at 702 um and the first thing on our agenda is we have several sets of minutes to look at i believe that all we have to do is kind of accept the two sets of minutes that are from planning board activities, February 29th, are just notes. They're not exactly kind of formal minutes anyways. And from the small group meeting on the 21st, I would like, we can do each of them separately if you want, but I would like to know, can we just accept the meeting, the notes uh, from the February 29th planning session? <clears throat> if anyone has any objection to that, Please say something, and if not, well, I could take a thumbs up or any kind of way to just make sure that I'm sort of hearing from everybody. Um, I'm not quite seeing what Grover has to say or Gaston. Grover, do you have a concern? No. Okay, so we have we will have accepted the um, minutes from the 29th. <clears throat> How about the 21st? Again, it's just notes from the first small group meeting. Are, can we accept those? Uh, I see thumbs from everyone up. So we are accepting those minutes. <clears throat> and then the, or notes. And then the minutes that we have to approve, I think, are the minutes from our previous meeting on the 14th. Um, are there any comments or concerns about the minutes from the 14th? Doesn't look like it. How about um, yeah, that song? Yeah, my my I'm I'm looking at the exchange uh, with uh, Tom Reedy, and I guess 
I wonder if there could be a note that I said his answer was non-responsive. I heard something yeah, basically. Um, I, I I didn't feel like there was as much candor as I would have liked in that exchange about finances. Can you tell us where you are? I'm trying. Uh, to yes, to I'm. Um, uh, I will. Um, um, let me see. Um, uh, I am in the middle of. Okay, it's the third page of that meeting minutes, and there's a paragraph towards the bottom that says Gaston asked what the financial equation was. Um, I don't know what what could be what what exactly we Gosh. could say. Um, uh, I guess you could say G Gaston commented that that didn't answer the question. <laughs> that seems about That's right. Um, I Okay, I remember I, you saying that. <laughs> me too. I, mean, I I I said that's not the that's not relevant. I mean the 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 cost of building it is not wasn't relevant to what we were talking about. It was about the income stream, and he didn't answer that question, and and neither of them did. Um, so we we didn't really get clarity about the question that Paul originally asked, which is why do you want to do this? Um, and I thought it was really interesting that none of the reporting addressed the fact that we asked the planning board to consider the amount. I thought that our motion asset said that. I, I didn't see that covered in the Gazette or the, or the Indy. Oh, okay. Our motion did, but the papers didn't. I gotcha, gotcha. I misunderstood, sorry. Yeah, well, um, okay. Can we, Mr. Note Taker, Greg, do you understand enough what Gaston wants to be able to add it? I haven't um, quite found the place actually. Somehow. Yeah, I, I I found it and I Gaston, I think I understand that you're hoping we can note uh, that we asked specifically about the income stream. We asked him to clarify the income stream, and the applicant was not responsive to that inquiry. Exactly. After, yeah. And I just I have two things actually. Um, one is I think Nate might be in the audience, but then the other is um, on the I think it's the next page, towards the middle. Again, it says Gaston reiterated that the trust had not yet reached clarity of a different payment amount than detailed in the bylaw. I don't know if that fully addresses the fact that we were wondering about more money, but. Different thing though. I mean, I think yeah. he was talking about us and the, but, but in this case, the absence in the notes here, I think is what Gaston is saying is not highlighting that they in fact did not answer our question about that. Okay. Yeah. And I, I um allegra we were saying before nate is in a car driving somewhere oh, okay so we're kind of leaving him as an attendee unless he does something to let us know he really okay. wants to come or we really need to ask him something and okay. we bring him in the room so okay. he's kind of a listener at the moment all right i apologize i missed that part that's of okay no problem <laughs> i miss things all the time <laughs> um so uh are we if we make that amendment which Greg says he can make because he knows where it is. And are we okay with the minutes then as amended? Do we have, are we approving the amended minutes? Again, I'm looking for thumbs and I see uh, thumbs everywhere. Unanimous approval of the minutes. <clears throat> then I have two other just things that I wanna make known. Um, Mindy Dom is going to do some legislative updates herself. She's going to come. Grace is in the is an attendee now, but Mindy herself will come. But she might not be able to come at the particular place in our agenda where we have put those updates. When she shows up, without exactly interrupting a particular conversation. But anyways, we will probably adjust the order of the agenda to bring her into the room in a way that is most convenient to both us and her, but to make sure that we get her. And the other thing is that whatever else we move around, we have an update coming from Jessica Allen and it can't happen before eight o'clock. 
So those are come constraints that we're trying to make the the agenda work within, and I believe that they probably can. But uh, so if there's nothing else about the minutes that we've just talked about, we can move on to talking about the notes from the first strategic planning process. If anybody has questions, comments, thoughts, we will be having our second meeting the coming Thursday, this coming Thursday. Um, there are notes there. The next meeting will be 418 at 11 a.m. <clears throat> oh, I have one other announcement I realized that I need to make, which is that um, Corinne has unfortunately and regrettably from her point of view had to resign for personal reasons. So we have another vacancy again, but um, she was she was very thoughtful in her response and sorry that she was in a situation to have to do with what she thought that she had to. So yes, is that a hand up? Okay. It is. Can I just clarify, is this plus Paul who's missing tonight our full membership then? Am we I missing? Have, okay. Yes, we have, inter so we have, we have, now we have two vacancies. Okay. We have interviewed someone for one of them, but uh, nothing has happened so far. So, okay. so yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But so we're at quorum. We have a quorum. Yes, okay. here we are. We have six of us. We only need five of us for quorum, I think. So we're, we're still good. Thank you. Because we're also dedicated and show up. It's great. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anyone has anyone who was at the small meeting, the strategic planning process meeting, has anything that they want to report out. We have a conversation that we will probably have next time and have a longer report at our following meeting. But so if anybody has any questions from looking at the notes that they read or anything, we would, one or some or other of us would be happy to respond. Well, let me just um, say that that uh, following the meeting, um, Greg and Shelley started developing goals. So so in, in the meeting, we we basically uh, came to consensus that there were there were three main areas of of interest that that the whole group had um, identified as as potential uh, sources for goals. And that is units, uh, funding, and some some way to address uh, the market um, advocacy, working with UMass, uh, that kind of thing. So three main um, areas, three main topics. Um, and the and the draft goals, um, you know, there this is extremely preliminary. Um, and obviously we're not going to decide what the goals are. We're all going to decide. The small group is not going to decide or everyone's going to decide. Um, is regarding units or development, um, support the creation of 250 homes, affordable to people earning below 100 percent AMI over the next few years. That's just a broad goal we could, obviously we should discuss it and tweak it. Funding, secure $4 million over the next five years to support the work of the trust. Um, regarding the market, we were not really able to come up with a, a goal that we could define, that we could lay out. So so that's, that's just a... Um, FYI, we recognize that that was something that the, the body was interested in, but we're not sure that we could actually come up with something. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so obviously it's a work in progress and uh, yeah. Grover has a hand up. Yeah, Rob, uh, thank you for that report back. Can you, I didn't quite catch the your final sort of three points of the specificity of the goals. Can you say what it was for the unit goals? Yep. Yeah. Um, so the draft 
proposal is support the creation of 250 homes affordable to people earning below 100% AMI over the next five years. Okay. And, and so then, under that, we might have, you know, different strategies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or thoughts, Erica? I was just going to add, <clears throat> one of the things Shelley um, asked us to reconsider is um, not to create too much specificity around what we might consider uh, priority populations um, because she felt that, uh, and, and I hate talking for her because I might have misunderstood it, but um, that it would put us too much in an um, pigeonhole us, whereas it would n not give us the flexibility around allowing us for opportunities. Um, and I think <clears throat> I think that's a, an area where I was struggling. Um, you know, I get the low uh, and uh, the moderate and low um, income, but I know you know there there are certain priorities that I think are important just in terms of some of the work that the trust has done in the past around seniors, around individuals uh, with disabilities, et cetera. But she just it. it it was just a caution. Um, so I think, you know, the next meeting is going to be really a good, robust conversation about, um, but she, she thought it would be better to have uh, more umbrella goals and then the strategies could be very specific, um, but being careful about um, having a goal, have too much specificity in it that it pigeons, you know, it, it might um, reduce the opportunities for us. <clears throat> Yeah, I try to have goals that are measurable, but not uh, ending up to feel like they exclude something we haven't thought about that looks really good and comes along. So, Actually, that's a really good way of putting it, Carol, <clears throat> because when we talked about priorities, uh, she said, well, who does that then exclude? And is that going to then yeah. make it more difficult? Yes, that's, I think, the more positive way of saying it than the way I said it. Yeah, because so much as we have known in our history of what we ever done so far, so much depends on what opportunities arise that we don't know at the moment. You know, I mean, who knew who knew Valley was going to buy Ball Lane property? Who knew uh, the town and the trust was going to be able to buy the Belcher Town Road property? And by putting that together with East Street, that was going to make it something that would work where it hadn't worked just at East Street by itself. There's just all kinds of things that you so much don't know. No. Or some piece of property that right now is it's a strong street. Something happens with strong street and finally we can actually do something there. And it's not quite maybe what we thought we could, but it still seems like a good thing to do. So yeah, so I think there's good reason not to try to get too Anyway, that's one of the things we're thinking about. And if people have thoughts about it now, please speak now or you'll get more chances, of course. But if anybody has anything else to say, please do. Grover. Well, this is, you know, the first time I'm hearing this perspective. So it's good that we're having a deeper conversation next week. It'll give us some time to think more about it. But a reaction, I have... Uh, I have a reactionary reaction to it in that I think I hear the sense of opportunity and at this, like, we need to be open to the opportunities that come to us. And at the same time, because the document is creating a sort of structure and vision for the trust in the years ahead, and its goal is to be durable, even as, like, if our two co chairs moved out of their, you know, like it, as we change up who's on the trust and who's leading, it's still supposed to be the guiding document. And so having more specificity then allows the public and the members to hold that to more account. Because I could imagine, I, I could imagine a scenario that I wouldn't feel proud of in the end where we got like a ton of like 80% AMI units and very few low income ones and very few accessible ones. And I would feel bummed. 
that that was the outcome. Um, and just also saying that there's a question of who does it exclude, but in the example of disability, uh, a housing unit that is accessible, is built accessible, is more accessible for anyone who lives there and any person who's able-bodied now could become disabled at any point. So I see no exclusion in building more accessible units or having that be a, a goal or naming that as a priority. Thank you. Um, Allegra. Um, so I know that we talk a lot about units and obviously that's important. And I'm just, I guess, kind of to go off with Grover says about, um, it'd be really a bummer to have like all the units be in the 80 to hundred range, for example. But I was, I've just been thinking about like the affordability of existing units. And I, um, I wonder if there is some creativity and room or if, if there would be a way to, again, consider if some of our funding could be used towards subsidizing current units that otherwise wouldn't be affordable, kind of like the um, the the chunk of change that we gave to Craig's doors for the um, the people that were exiting um, shelter. So I, I just don't know if that could be considered or conceptualized within the idea of units. Um, as maybe one of the strategies, if that's something that the trust would agree with. I can't offhand see any reason why it couldn't conceivably be a strategy under getting units, but yeah, that's a good point. Maybe there are... Well, <clears throat> I mean... oh, I'm well, sorry, I thought you started to say something, Grover, I think, and I... It's true, but then I saw Gassam wanted to talk and he hasn't talked yet. But I do have a direct response to Allegra's statement. <laughs> okay, I'm um, stop. is that okay? Fire go ahead. Okay, so um, I very much like the idea of sort of immediate subsidy to people who are in existing units, um, and would totally support that being one of our goals. And at the same time, I would be hesitant to put it under the measurement of units because when we advocate or fund or support the building of a tax credit affordable unit, it stays affordable in perpetuity, whereas giving a subsidy for a year or two a person doesn't. So in terms of the long-term impact of that, it's, it's important, but it's not the same. So I just want to create a different bucket or a different sub goal in order to measure that. And I would be all for it. So it's like maybe the goal as a unit, it's uh, affordability and then it's long term, short term. Thanks, both of you. Gaston, did you have something yeah. you were trying to say? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, my mind's always, you know, trying to uh, make this all fit together. And it seems like um, I, I, I think that Grover's um, uh, emphasis on let's keep units meaning units that are permanently affordable. Um, and one of the themes that came up at our last meeting was about the lack of accessibility to even existing affordable units due to process issues. And so maybe it's a, either a sub prong or a whole second goal of increasing accessibility and affordability of units in town or something along those lines. It's, the activity is about helping people access and, and, and that could include the subsidies, I guess, is um, uh, in, in that bucket. Thanks. Um, somebody, Rob, did you have your hand up? Yeah, so um, I would say that uh, so so there's there is another set of goals or another goal which is fundraising, ra you know, raising funds, and and one is not subservient to the other. So so we want to um, have four million, four million dollars or or whatever we want, whatever we decide to choose, so that we can provide funding to Craig's stores or, or to whomever. Not not so that we can accomplish the first goal just, 
so that we can do all the other things that are important. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Well, clearly this is an ongoing conversation and if anybody who isn't part of the small group wants to come to the meeting, of course, you'd be very welcome. Um, it's the 18th at 11 o'clock. Yes, and it's for an hour. Shelly will be there too. Um, if, I was going to say, sorry, Carol, I didn't have my hand up. Um, okay. We are probably going to spend um, a lot of time in May going over what the subgroup has come up with next um, Thursday. So um, Carol and I and Greg um, talked about uh, really putting aside some major amount of time where we can actually come back with what is sort of being discussed as a draft and then the larger group can look at it beforehand and then we'll have much more time to digest it and provide feedback to it. Yeah, I think there's I think there's still a lot of work left and so getting even to a draft that's a skeleton of a draft will be something and there'll be a lot of work after that as well. Uh, so moving on, if I can, we would have now some updates on the status of some other town projects, which I think the first of those is a VFW update, which I believe is coming from Dave. I see that you're there. Dave, would you like to speak, please? Hi. Good evening, everybody. Sorry, I was between meetings and just trying to eat a little dinner. Eat dinner. That's a good no, thing to do. I'm I'm here, I'm listening, but uh, try to get a little dinner in. I don't want to steal, steal Greg's thunder. I know that you wanted to give a little update. I think Greg had spoken with Rob Mora. Do you want me to start, Greg, or do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, sure. I can share. Uh, Still just in around the edges, but I think you, Greg, had... Uh, yeah, had some, some, I, uh, I did catch up with Rob today in the, in the sort of um, operational update um, on the VFW project is that we are... Uh, I'm told very close to engaging with um, an architect on that initial sort of short-term scoping process, which we've discussed. So my understanding is we hope to be in contract with them very soon. There's somebody that's identified. I'm not sure if I'm officially empowered to name them yet, um, but it's a, a, a reputable firm um, familiar with the work, uh, which is uh, which is very exciting. So um, so that that step is is moving forward, which is really cool. And that, in short order, will cascade into sort of working groups and public input sessions, et cetera. So that's kind of the first um, step to turn this idea into a more of a concept on paper and then, you know, whatever the 21st century version of paper is. I think that's the, that's the sort of relational update, correct Dave? Yeah, With yep. partners. yeah we're very, we're very excited. I think uh, easily by your next meeting, we will be able to, or even by email, we'll be able to announce soon as we contract with this firm, we'll be able to announce uh, who they are and their experience. I think you'll be, if all goes well, you'll be very pleased because we are kind of ecstatic. Um, and did you want to talk, did, uh, did you get any information on demo date for the building? I think we wanted to cover, you know, just a little bit of update on demo, uh, the trip to Father Bill's. And then I think there was a question about um, the site and any, you know, any concerns people might have about using it as a lay down area or any kind of staging area for the Jones. So we can take those in that order if you want. Any update? Are, can yeah. I just add that we were also hoping you could give us some vague, rough, I know, idea about timeline so that we aren't expecting it to be built in the next year and a half, because I'm pretty sure it won't. And so having some real timeline, I know you don't have it all tied down, but something like that is an important thing that we would like to know also. Sure, let's let's conclude with that, if we could, Carol, remind me. That's but, fine, that's Greg, fine, did okay. You, did you get any information uh, more I, current from Rob? I know we're poised to, uh, to uh, demo the building. Um, you know, I actually, I, I, I know we've, we, we have a contract for that is my understanding, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually get an update. I was more, I, I kind of figured it was pending, like, I think weeks, yeah. right. You know, I think yeah. it's, I think it's all, you know, it's all uh, contracted and we're ready to go. It'll just be when the uh, demo crew can schedule it and move that building off site. So I think we're within weeks of that building coming down. 
uh, we did all the, um, uh, um, you know, looking for asbestos and any other contaminants in the building. And I believe that was, uh, if it hasn't been removed already, that'll be removed. Any of that stuff will be removed before the demo. And so the site will be clean. And then the uh, question about uh, lay down area, um, I guess we'll save that till the end because that's related to Carol's question about uh, timing. Uh, we are scheduled to go down to Father Bill's on uh, Wednesday the 17th. <clears throat> I believe Erica and Carol, um, I believe Erica uh, is able to go with us, uh, but Carol as a co-chair has a conflict. So did you two want to jump in here and talk yeah, about that? Yeah, so we, well, we wanted, I wanted to know, we wanted to know if there is a trust member who would like to, just one person, because they don't want to crowd the van too much. But if there's someone who would like to go with the group and Erica, because since I can't, uh, if there is anyone, please, please volunteer. Um, just to give people a sense, because I know, you have all have busy schedules. We'd probably be leaving <clears throat> approximately eight in the morning to get down there 10, 10, 15. We'll probably have about an hour, hour and a half to uh, meet with some of the staff at, um, I almost said Craig's doors, at Father Bill's. And um, <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, Tim McCarthy and some of his staff will be going with us. Um, so an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, they need to be done by about 12, 1230. Um, we could grab a pick, quick bite to eat or if people bring sandwiches or whatever, a little lunch, we can turn it right back around and barring major traffic, we'll try to get back here by, you know, mid afternoon, three o'clock, maybe 3.30, something like that. And we're using, we'll be, uh, I do have a van from the fire department uh, that we're able to take uh, one additional person from the trust. So that's kind of the, the rough schedule and we you know, we uh, we'd meet at town hall or something like that. We we'll work out the the fine details here in the next three four days. Um, so if anybody would like to, you could be in touch with uh, with Erica or Carol, and and we'll make it happen. Or Greg. Greg is going. I think Rob Mora plans to go. Nate Malloy, Tim McCarthy, and and a couple of his staff as well. So yeah, so be great if somebody. I know it's short notice and a difficult time, but if it can work for anybody, it would be great if someone else from the trust goes. So yeah. back um, to you, Dave. Okay. Um, so there was a question about, uh, I think in the newspaper a couple, three, four or five weeks ago, there was some reference to the um, site as a possible lay down area or staging area for the Jones. And I think the town manager is offering that. Uh, first off, we don't, we don't know, um, yet uh, bids are not in for the Jones Library. So that is a step that the town still needs to take. I, I believe bids are due later in April for the library. So there'll be, you know, information coming to all of us, to the community on how those bids um, uh, uh, shake out. Um, but in terms of a laydown area, we don't see this. I mean, if all goes well with the bids for the Jones, um, that building will be built before the shelter is built. I mean, we have, this is a, a, a horizon here. We're probably talking, you know, minimum three years away. Um, this is what it's gonna take. You know, we're talking tens of millions of dollars to build this building. Um, so we've got a long way to go with funding, working through DHCD. Um, I don't have a cost estimate. That'll all come out of the work with the designer, but um, with the, with the, per unit cost and construction cost uh, where they are, you know, I would not be surprised if it, this is a $30 million building. So it's going to take a few years to pull that whole package together, not unlike what it takes uh, Wayfinders or a Valley CDC to pull together one of their projects. Keep in mind, you know, it's not going to be the town that develops this. We, we are going to work with you. Um, you'll be at the table. We'll put together an RFP. We'll RFP the site for what we'd like on the site. And we already know there's interest uh, from our partners in the in the affordable housing and sheltering world. So we'll put together an RFP, um, uh, solicit bids, interview uh, uh, and select uh, the, the appropriate firm. And then they will go through a similar process to what um, uh, uh, East Street School or um, 
um, you know, Ball Lane went through. So it's going to take, you know, some really hard work and um, advocacy in Boston to to get us the appropriate funding. So we're a couple of years away, and uh, th there should be no problem um, moving off the site um, with the Jones, any of the Jones work, if needed. So that's kind of where we are. Any questions about the VFW project? Then shall we move on to the new housing production plan? That's probably short. We were trying to find a contractor. Oops, Erica has her hand up. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. So I just, I just wanted to say to um, our trust members that if uh, none of you can make it, but you have some really, really good questions for me uh, to ask uh, when uh, we go, um, I think that would be very valuable. So please, um, you know, uh, send send them, you know, the, the questions to Carol and to me and to Greg, uh, and I'll make sure that I get answers. And I'm hoping that there'll be a possibility of maybe taking some pictures. I know, you know, uh, confidentiality would be important if they're if their clients there, but um, just to really get a good sense of how they developed their site and the sustainable funding that they're getting to maintain father bills will be important to understand. Mm -hmm. Carol, if I could, before you move on, maybe yep. I, miss, I missed this because I joined a few minutes late. Did um, you are aware of the planning board's decision last night for Barry Roberts' project? Was that on your agenda? So we didn't. It's oh. going to be an announcement later. Oh, but okay. go ahead, announce it now. <laughs> well, I think Greg, you're you're in the know about that, right? Sure, I am. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm happy to um, update on that. So uh, the planning board did uh, approve the special permit. It was a special permit last night for the um, South Pleasant Street Hastings building project, which our group discussed um, at our last formal meeting of the group. Um, and uh, they did approve uh, the payment in of the inclusionary units as well. Um, that the my understanding of the number that was approved was was reflected in the bylaw. It's, unfortunately, it, it, it was not a, a larger number than that. I haven't seen the precise language, but my understanding is they left the door open for the applicant to informally offer additional supports or additional funds. Um, but, um, but that, but, but that's not an enforceable component, but what's enforceable is by the bylaw. And I think that number is 1.2 and change uh, is my recollection. Um, um, so, uh, so that's exciting. And my understanding is as per the bylaw, the, the routing of, of those funds um, needs to come before there's a certificate of occupancy for the uh, for the, the market rate building um, meeting at the end of construction is, you know, and that's, that's kind of what's written down. Perhaps it could be sooner than that. Um, but I think we could require that it not be later. Uh, the other, yes, no. Oh, I'll wait for Dave to go. The other thing I was just going to add is this project is very much on a fast track. So demolition is beginning uh, in the next five five days. So um, what Greg said is, you know, the, the the payment won't actually come for for a while. But Barry Roberts and his team are really moving quickly now that they have their approval. So the uh, the old parts of the building will come down as per the permit. Um, I believe fencing will start going up tomorrow or Saturday morning. So um, you will see fencing up there, uh, construction fencing, and they'll go from, uh, I think, uh, demo is probably a three to five day period. And then they begin the building of of the of the new right. unit. So anyway, just so you know, it's not that one's not going to be years in the making. So that payment is is going to be moving more quickly than than I think any of us thought. So that's all. Interestingly, it is always quicker to build something if you don't have to make it affordable and go through all kinds of financing hoo-ha in order to get there. Ho, ho, ho. Gaston, did you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, I, I was just, would like to request feedback about the extent to which the planning board did what we asked them to, which was to study the, the amount rather than just take it from the bylaw. Uh, does I, anybody have I an can, answer to that? Nate, 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 do you want to Nate say something? was there. He's probably the best person. He's got his hand up. So speak, Nate. I'll make something up. They um, 
Yeah, it was kind of interesting. Uh, Tom Reedy had said that, as you know, representing the applicant, that they would be willing to pay more. Um, you know, some of the planning board members felt that the bylaw didn't have the flexibility to require more. And so I said, well, that could be a finding of the special permit, right? So, you know, you can you can find that it's justifiable because of the current cost of construction, the location, size of units. Uh, but some members really didn't feel comfortable with that just because of the you know technicality of the way the bylaw is written. And so some of them, one of them said, well, if you want to make it more, you have to change the bylaw language. And I was like, well, sure, then I will. <clears throat> so I think we should actually recommend a revision to the inclusionary zoning bylaw. Like, you know, it could be done in a week and then we could try to get it through. Um, you know, the planning staff had recommended 600,000 a unit, you know, for a $1.8 million payment. Uh, the applicants thought that was a little much and they really, you know, wanted to know if the idea was, you know, a one for one total development cost per unit. And I said that was the idea when this was generated, you know, even though it could leverage more than, you know, the three units, it's that, you know, if we were to go out and have to purchase a property and then build three units, especially in downtown, it's going to cost more than 1.1 million. But they felt that the language in the bylaw wasn't, you know, like I said, it said shall provide a payment equal to this. And they said, where is the ability to require more, more funding? And so the, the condition reads that they will provide that amount with the encouragement that the applicant, um, you know, pay more. And so I have to talk to Chris and Rob uh, tomorrow staff and just see what, what they would be willing to do. So, I mean, Tom Reedy still kind of said, well, yeah, maybe like 1.4, 1.5 million, but you know, it's somewhat, um, you know, they're not obligated to. So there was some discussion, you know, Wayfinders pro forma for the project in East Amherst, you know, it's about 550 a unit. You know, they kind of questioned what the costs were. I still think that, you know, there's some discrepancy about how you figure out what the value of a unit is, right? And so, um, you know, I, I was saying that it's a 10 to 12 year payback, maybe less. They're still saying it's a 20 to 22 year payback. And I, I disagree because once the building's built, if you take the value of what the rents are and you just say what, you know, gross numbers, what is it going to be, you know, after so many years there, you know, that payment is, is made, um, especially with the rental charge. I mean, they mentioned 2250 for a one bedroom or 2300 for a one bedroom going higher. So, yeah, I mean, the, the planning board actually discussed this for a bit, you know, they, like I said, they, I think if the bylaw was written in a way that they could allow it, they would have, but they didn't feel like they had that authority to make that a condition. So I, I think for me, the uh, end of the day is we should revise the bylaw, you know, change the formula a bit. You know, they talked about like, you know, what if it's different unit sizes and what have you. And so I think we need to have some language to allow flexibility. Um, they did understand that the trust, you know, I said that you pull less around a payment pretty quickly uh, in part because um, you know, you know, it's, it's great to capitalize the trust. There's flexibility in those funds and that, you know, there's other ways to get affordable units. So the loss of three affordable units could be leveraged to get more. Uh, and so, you know, they didn't, one of the members actually said, you know, well, should we just require these units if they're so valuable? Uh, but the board, you know, they, they respected the recommendations from the trust and they didn't, they, they didn't necessarily think that that was the case, but, you know, every time there's, a request for this it is a special permit and there's no precedent setting you know um basis and so you know if it comes up on a next project it's not like well because they you recommended and they recommended or allowed a payment in lieu that they need to follow the same course of action and so i think that you know uh as it moves forward i think it you know everyone can make you know that decision on a project basis but thanks nate uh, Grover? I saw Gaston was actually unmuted first. Do you want to go? Well, my, I, I, I never muted myself again, but my, my follow-up just was, um, and I guess Nate and, and company, it, who is communicating to the town council to share this experience so they can process it and make any change they desire? Yeah, so I mean, it's something that I was going to talk to staff about, you know, if it, you know, who sponsors that zoning amendment? Um, you know, it, it could be a really simple thing. I've often said that maybe we should have another tier of affordability in the inclusionary zoning so that, you know, we we have a 12 percent um, calculation if there's, you know, basically 20 more units. But could we have a 
13 to 20 percent, you know, or up, you know, some difference that goes up to a certain AMI or restructure it. Or so, you know, I, I think if we're doing that, it might be a chance to say what else would we want to consider. Uh, so sometimes I think that, you know, just 10 or 12 percent of the units is not a big enough percentage, and it hasn't deterred development in a way that when we first did this, we thought it might. You know, some there was some concern that if you have too high a percentage of affordable units, you actually then discourage development, but I don't think the market uh, is swayed yet by that number. So, you know, can we, so I think there's a few adjustments um, and, you know, the idea right with council now is that town council that we could be a little bit quicker in terms of a zoning amendment. So if we think that those other pieces are gonna bog down this one amendment, we could just make a change to the payment and loop provision while we're looking at other things. So I think it could happen quickly. It's just the next, it will go through a process, but I, you know, I'd like to get that moving actually just on the uh, kind of a fresh on the heels of this. My question, my question is following up on that related. So can you give us a sense, Nate, of like the next three steps of how that would happen? So, you know, like, yeah. it sounds like your team is discussing it and then what you, you take it to a council member to sponsor it. You propose it yourself. No, no, I, I would, I, I would ask that the planning board sponsor it, and so that you know they're they're a, a named body that can bring in a, a zoning amendment forward. Otherwise, it would go to council, but then they refer. You know, it, it 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 could be a more circuitous route. So if the planning board, you know, actually would, you know, I think they kind of said it rhetorically, like, oh, revise the bylaw. But I'm thinking, well, if it's a really simple change let's do it. Um, you know, they might ask some more questions about how do we justify what the amount is. But to me, it's kind of like the bylaw says, you know, shall provide a payment. And to me, it's like, you could just put in some little phrases like at a, you know, provide at a minimum, but could be greater than, you know, something. And then just, that just allows that. So it's like, you know, it could be a really simple amendment. Um, so yeah, so I would talk it over with the building commissioner and planning director, see if we can get it in front of the planning board at their next meeting. Uh, which there's going to be next week, but uh, they're taking a week off. So it'll be, you know, in a few weeks and then go from there. And so, you know, if they agree to it, then they would recommend it to council and then they would have a first reading and it would be referred to, you know, a few, you know, subcommittees of them and the planning board again, and then come back. Uh, but, um, you know, it, even if a, a quick amendment would, you know, it's a few months, right. There's a number of steps it has to follow, but. Anybody else? I guess I would like to suggest trying to do the simplest possible amendment and worry about all the rest of the stuff later. Just put in at least and more than case, but whatever the thing that you just said. So it op so it leaves the possibility, it leaves the floor where it is, but it creates a possibility to do more so the planning board doesn't have to feel like they don't have the authority to do more if they want. That's the simplest thing. Worry about doing more than that later. But if you can take that to the planning board, I at least personally encourage you. I don't see anybody sort of disagreeing with that here right now, um, Allegra. I think I agree with you, Carol, but I also think it would be, and maybe this requires more thought and planning, but I do think it would be helpful to maybe increase the percentage of units, um, given the fact that we have seen this hasn't deterred development as of yet. Um, so I don't know if that would, again, be another easy fix to say, like, from 12 to 17 or whatever it is that we choose to, I mean, that seems like a weird number, but it's the one that came out of my mouth. So <laughs> um, hey, let's go with it. <laughs> yeah, perfect. 17, 17 percent. Let's do it. Also, also, I don't know if this, right, it's like, without having all the language and the bylaws in front of me, I can't spell it out, but I'd also like to know where or if, if, if it's this bylaw or a different bylaw, we can get stronger accountability about the time to fill the units and the collaboration about that, because what we were hearing from them about the affordable units standing empty while Wayfinders and Valley fills their units like the minute they're open. Um, 
I would like to find a solution to that. And so I don't know if the bylaw is the appropriate place for that or not. I'd be curious to hear what you think. Yeah, I don't I don't think the bylaw is an appropriate place for that. Uh, we could put it in rules and regs. I mean, often it's become a, like I said, we can benchmark it up until occupancy. So we do require, you know, the regulatory agreement to be recorded. We require, you know, a number of things uh, in, with inclusionary units so that we know uh, it's happening, right? So, but then after occupancy, it's really hard to have, we could say, you know, some condition about that. Um, but, it, you know, to be in the, in the bylaw seems a little strange. I will say that when Gabrielle spoke to the trust and said that, you know, there's all these units that are vacant, it was a little misleading because 11 to 13 East Pleasant is going through marketing right now. It's not as if the units have been vacant for years, right? They actually just got their um, TCO, you know, a few months ago. And the marketing was following right along. And Centuries Commons on Main Street, you know, has three affordable units. And one of them was going through marketing uh, late winter. And so to say that there's 15 units, yeah, there's, I think, 16 units downtown. But, you know, 13 of those have been going through marketing, you know, in February and March. And so to me, it's not as if they've been vacant for, you know, a year. I do think that there is... Like I said, I think there are some, you know, problems. I think it's probably statewide that, you know, affordable units, especially if it's not, um, you know, through a comprehensive permit or has some other other um, subsidies or, um, you know, it's not part of another project that in these, you know, the, the uh, property owners and managers can still have additional threshold requirements for tenants. So even if they're income eligible, they may not be able to pass the other things. And so... You know, to me, that's part of maybe an education or outreach component, uh, you know, or we change our inclusionary zoning bylaw so it's a lower amount to match a, you know, the, a voucher subsidy. Again, that becomes like a bigger question. It's not, you know, so I, I have a number of ideas, right, for inclusionary zoning, but it's not the simple one we just talked about for the payment in lieu, but, you know, it doesn't have to be 80%. In the bylaw, we do say a maximum of 80. Everyone chooses to go 80. You know, it's like, what if we said the maximum has to be less than the payment standard. Um, it's still eligible in Amherst on the SHI and it would allow a voucher holder. But yeah, so anyways, I, I do, yeah, I think that conversation though that Gabrielle said, I think it was, it's a good one. I think it's something Greg and I have talked about researching, like what is the structural issues there? Is it, you know, is it what, what you know, exactly is it um, additional requirements that are outside the lottery? Is it something we could discuss with property owners and managers? But I think right. having the bylaw is tricky because, um, you know, it's not, we can't really control that necessarily with the bylaw. We can't, I, you know, I don't, I, I'd have to, I, mean, I could talk to staff about it, but everything I've seen, that's something that's left to, you know, another piece of a regulation, whether it's rules and regs or. Um, mm -hmm. well, I'm going to ask us to end this conversation since actually we're talking about something that was an announcement of a good thing and we've gotten into a whole bunch of other stuff, which is all interesting and good, and we should come back to, and yes, we should work on it. We can keep this somehow on an agenda going forward. How do we amend the inclusionary zoning bylaw to get more of what we want out of it? Very good topic, but I think we might stop now. We have one more, one thing that's short, I think I just said, unless there's anything else, there is trying to get another contractor for the housing production plan. There may be some progress in that or not. And the other thing is, I know Dave is going to tell us something about the, pros the prospects of meeting with UMass. <clears throat> so, Dave, you want to go through those couple things? Sure. Was it just the UMass piece? Was there another one there, Carol? Did he? I, I don't think, unless there's more to say than that you're looking for another contractor for the housing production plan, then that's, I, then I just said it. If there's something else, please add it. But if that's it, then you don't have to say it. Yeah, I, I don't have any more on that. If uh, Nate, okay. Nate or Greg may be more involved in that, but Nate is shaking his head saying no new updates on that. Okay. Yeah, so then um, just... Do the yeah, UMass thing and then we'll move yeah, on. In terms of UMass, I know the trust um, heard from Nancy Buffone and uh, Tony Maroulis some couple of months ago, maybe two and a half, three months ago. I did reach out to them um, via your, your request uh, to me. Um, and I think the response was, it was, um, it was honest. It was upfront. It was, um, I think it was, very specific what they are 
not in a position, I guess, would be the best way to say it. They're not in a position, they don't feel, they're not in a position to meet with the trust or members of the trust. Their feeling is there is a structure set up within town that has the town manager and his staff meeting with uh, representatives, leadership at the university. And this is all laid out in the strategic partnership agreement. And their feeling is if there are discussions to be had, they should take place through leadership in the town. Um, I think their, I don't think it was their concern, but they were, they do not routinely meet with members of committees. They don't meet with the conservation commission. They don't meet with the planning board. They don't meet with the, you know, the the other other boards and committees in town. They don't meet with the town council. That is done via the town manager to leadership at UMass. Now they are open to a couple of things. One is through the in the strategic partnership agreement, it specifically calls out meetings on a couple of topics, such as housing and uh, economic development are two that are called out in the strategic partnership agreement. So they're very willing to meet with town manager, myself, Nate, the planning director on a staff level. And we're happy to bring any ideas, concerns, questions you have to those meetings and then report back to you. But, um, and by the way, they're more than happy to come to future meetings uh, of this body, they're also willing to come to any strategic housing uh, uh, meetings you might have as you think about your strategic plan and the housing production plan. But I think they um, um, are not in a position to meet with the trust or members of the trust um, at that level. So that was the, the quick summary. Dave, I just want to add, at least I thought when you were saying it to us before, part of it was that they didn't want to meet in non-public meetings with us. So they would meet with all of us in a public meeting, but they don't want to have like behind the scenes things going on with the trust or any other committee. Um, that is very part true. Of it. Yeah. That is, okay. that is very true. I, I, I forgot that. Thank you for jogging my memory. Uh, it's been a couple, three to four weeks now <laughs> since I had that conversation with them. But that is, yeah, yeah. as I said, they're happy to meet with you in these meetings. They're happy to come to strategic planning meetings that you might uh, invite them, other for-profit, non-profit developers and the community to talk about housing, both affordable and, and our housing crisis. But it's just the kind of private meetings with a committee that they did not they feel like do. they were comfortable doing. But again, I'm a conduit by which you can Bo and Paul is usually here. Um, we are conduits by which you can bring your concerns and or questions, um, and we can take those to UMass in these periodic. I think we're, I can't remember off the top of my head, but the strategic partnership agreement calls for us to meet, I want to say quarterly or a few times a year, I can't recall specifically on those various topics. So here it is. You know, first part of April, we're due to have such a meeting. So I'm happy to bring, if the trust wanted to have a discussion at one of their meetings, develop questions, or you could send them directly to me. And um, we will be scheduling a meeting on various topics with UMass coming up very soon. Um. So, yeah, I'm not sure that we can write this minute, sit here and make that list. But Understood. I think that we would like that opportunity very much. I'm sure at least I would. And so let's see what Gaston and then Erica has to say. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Dave. I mean, my, my question was basically going to be about where you ended, which is how can we just institutionalize that um, opportunity for us to think exactly what we want to bring to you to bring to that meeting? And uh, so you said the next meeting is April, what, what date? I didn't give a specific date for when we are meeting with UMass. Um, that hasn't been set yet, but yeah. here, here we are on the 11th of April and we're, we're due to schedule that meeting. So I think anytime now, if 
Okay. You wanted to, uh, I don't know when you, you all meet once a month, you could even get those, you know, you could have this as an agenda item next meeting, okay. if that was the proper way to do it. Um, yeah. Or you could go through your staff members and have, you can't deliberate on the, well, you can deliberate on these questions in public, but if you wanted to send questions individually to Greg or Nate, I think you could do that. You could do it that way too. And that would be a little faster, to be honest as opposed to waiting till your May meeting. Is Erica. That well, as long as it's before your meeting, it doesn't matter so much. Um, so I, I would think it's a great thing to put on our next agenda so long as, I mean, you have been having those meetings every quarter. You've been, you're following the, the, the plan. We meet, we actually meet with UMass once a week. <laughs> so uh, right. we have regular meetings with them. We okay. have not had a meeting in 2024 where we focus specifically on housing. So that's what right. I'm saying. We're, we're due to have that. I don't have a date yet. The sooner you can yeah. you know, formulate some questions, the better. So it's if it's at your next meeting, that's fine. You know, the other thing is I, I'm looking for the 2023 partnership agreement. I can't find it on the website. Oh, I, I'm finding only the 2015 one. I wonder if we could get in the new. Yeah, I'm sure Nate or Greg could dig that up on the website and send it to you all. Yeah. Thank great. you. That's a good yeah. idea. Uh, Erica and then Greg. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so I agree, we need to meet, um, because I think in the past, we've talked about a lot of things that we would love to have a conversation or at least recommend, such as the possibility of surplus land or land um, that they could identify uh, where we could uh, maybe partner around both student and faculty housing. Uh, we talked about the possibility of making some issues either about enrollment caps, or at least um, getting an agreement that if the enrollment caps are moving, that the town should be notified if it's going to impact off-campus housing or policy issues such as when they made the decision around allowing sophomores to go off campus where, you know, the town should be notified. Um, and then use of, you know, their facilities, is that something that, or other things that they can give back to the town to allow the town a little bit more benefit of having them? And then just um, thinking about how we can actually come to um, sort of a partnership agreement that we both want the same things, which is that we want to have accessible housing for student and faculty, but not have such a negative impact on the community here, which I'm sure that's also their goal as well. So yes, we, we do need to meet. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if May is going to be a little tough because we're already having a whole bunch of other uh, agenda items and I'd be willing to meet with people beforehand. Um, but it sounds to me that the town's meeting every week as well. So it may not be that um, necessary to expedite our conversation. Yeah, and just to be clear, we don't meet every week on housing. We meet every week on a range of topics, but this could easily be one of them, you know, Again, I would I would wait for your input, however you gather it, and then we I would schedule this discussion. Um, I'm I'm well, Greg first. Yeah, I was just gonna maybe propose a potential process there. Certainly, folks can email questions, inquiries, whatever, directly to me. I could synthesize all of those, and then we could look at a you know that synthesized product maybe in a relatively tighter window in a meeting to sort of confirm that that's kind of, you know, what the, you know, what the collective desire is to, to understand from them. And then we could transmit that to Dave. Is that a process so that makes that, make sense? Yeah. So if what we agree to is that whatever suggestions any of us have, we will email them to Greg. Greg will put something together for us and we will bring it to the May meeting. And we will fit it in. And, and I think that if the town and the, and the um, UMass are meeting weekly, that we there's not only this once a quarter opportunity. It seems to me that if you're meeting weekly, I couldn't you, Dave, say, we would like to have the next meeting or the meeting of blah -de blah be about housing. We've got some questions and we'd like to address them with you. Do you can you do something like that if you feel like it? We can. We're you know, yeah, this, is, so, this is flexible so enough. Yeah. The one thing I would add, Carol, is what I would probably see our process as staff being is. We would get this list, 
I would meet with Nate and Greg and perhaps, you know, Chris Brestrup, our planning director, perhaps Rob Mora, we'd get in a room. We'd kind of come up with what is from, from the broad town's perspective and, and what questions do we have as well? And yep. we would probably want to get in a room or get in, get on a zoom call with not only Tony and Nancy, but some of the planning staff and the physical plant staff who make those decisions about kind of master plan level decisions on the UMass campus. Uh, apropos of what Erica uh, mentioned, uh, you know, the governor has has made it clear that all state agencies to, should look, given our housing crisis statewide, should look at all of their land and assess whether they have any land that they feel they can surplus or use for housing. I, I can't tell you how many meetings I was in with the former chancellor with Swami, where he said, you know, one of my big focus points is housing for faculty, staff, and students. And he achieved some of that in his time. And, you know, we have, um, you know, we have the Commonwealth College and we have uh, Fieldstone um, as part of um, Swami's legacy, you know, hundreds of units on campus for both undergrads and graduates. And I forgot also the re uh, uh, um, the uh, the project they did on North Pleasant Street that used to be what was it called the University Park? No, I I forgot the new name of it, but the new graduate student housing that they completely redid, uh, demoed and and redid top to top to bottom off of North Pleasant Street, and they renamed it University Park, maybe University anyway. College. Yeah, village. There we go. Thank you, Allegra. So those were all Swami, part of Swami's legacy, but we need to continue. So. So we so, have, I think we have opportunities to do that. We have a, we have a defined, I believe, <clears throat> process right now for what we're going to do. Um, so unless there's something else that someone desperately needs to say right now, I would like to move on. <clears throat> and move on by uh, turning, I see that Jessica, both Jessica Allen and Laura Baker and the Allen, Jessica was going to give us some information and I'm going to turn the meeting over to Erica. To do Thank that. you. Carol. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, so we want to, um, report on current projects and we had asked, uh, Jessica Allen, um, and she is joined by Laura Baker to, um, join us in the room and to announce um, the wonderful news that the ZBA has approved um, the community, the Amherst community homes. So uh, one, we also asked her to um, talk to us about how we can continue to support the project moving forward. But we're very excited to have Jessica here, um, who is um, the real estate project manager and has done actually a wonderful job in outreach to the community, um, both with site tours and just making sure that the community is involved in any concerns or any um, ideas about design and making sure that it's a you know welcoming um, uh, development here and the last thing I'm going to say is I live in North Amherst and we're so excited about this project so thank you Jessica. Sure thanks for the invite I really appreciate it um, I love talking about this project so I'm happy to have an audience who wants to listen to it. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot that's happened, uh, I think, since the last time that we've seen one another. Um, so the big news is that we received our permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, after about a seven month process, we filed the permits in August. Our first hearing was in October and we wrapped up in March. So that was huge, that's awesome. Um, the decision has yet to be filed with the town clerk. I understand that it will likely happen tomorrow. The town's deadline is Wednesday, so it will certainly happen before then, uh, next Wednesday. And uh, once it's filed with the town clerk, then the uh, appeal period clock starts and we have 20 days. Hopefully nobody will come out of the woodwork. Um, and then once that appeal period's over, we're kind of free and clear from the permitting side. We also... Um, went through a permitting process with the Conservation Commission since there were wetlands on the site. Um, and so that permit was granted prior to the ZBA. So ZBA wouldn't button theirs up until CONCOM was done. So that is the big the big news to celebrate. Um, we're excited that, that that 
piece is over, but we do have a lot of work that we need to do over the next year before we start getting into construction. So um, big picture and the big goal is that we'll be breaking ground next spring. So that's what we're targeting. Um, in order for us to do that, there's a lot that needs to happen um, that most most communities don't see sort of behind the scenes sausage making of, of this aspect. So um, again, I'm thrilled that you're interested and excited and, and want to hear more about it. So um, there's kind of like a couple big pieces that are moving forward. So one is the marketing piece. So we have been in conversations with two um two companies. One is DVM Housing and the other is OVI, Our Village Initiative. And so these are two businesses that are owned by women of color. Um, DVM is, she is a real estate developer. She's been working in the affordable housing realm for a long time. She worked at a CDC um, in, uh, in Boston area. And she and we were partnered up with them, or at least introduced um, to them through the Commonwealth Builders Program. They had been partnered with other Commonwealth Builder developers in Boston and Roxbury, and they do a really amazing job of sort of partnering that marketing piece to um, to households of color, and also understanding that financial literacy is a huge part of getting somebody to be a homeowner. So OVI's mission is that financial literacy piece. And we've been talking internally about using financial literacy and getting people queued up um, and using that as a marketing opportunity so that um, folks are able to qualify for mortgage because there are, there are some requirements in order to be able to even be entered into lottery. So you need to be a first time home buyer. You need to be able to qualify for a standard mortgage, which means you need to have a credit score over 660 right now. Um, and you need to have assets that are less than $100,000. You need to be able to provide closing costs. Um, and you need to be able to put at least 3% down for down payment. So those are requirements um, of the program. So anybody who's going to be purchasing needs to hit those benchmarks. And so when we have conversations about households of color and understanding their financial capacity and the education that has been typically um, done in those communities, um, they're a little bit behind. And so we are partnering with OVI to help with that um, educational piece to get people to understand what does it take to, to buy a house? What are the pieces that you need to have the play in place? And OVI does a fantastic job of kind of handholding somebody through that process. So it's not like just a one-off, like, here's what you need to do. Here's a one-off workshop. They have monthly workshops every month. They do check-ins with individuals. And so our concept really is to try to do the lottery process as early as possible before we even have buildings in place. So as construction starts, we start that lottery process then, giving people adequate time to get their financial ducks in order. So getting that down payment, um, money set aside, making sure they have money for closing costs. Um, and so so we're really excited. Like this is a, a kind of innovative way to approach this is to do it that early. And they've been they've been looking to kind of test that aspect of, of this. They haven't been able to do that due to city of Boston regulations. Um, so this will be for them, it's exciting opportunity to get people a little bit more ahead of the game um, with that marketing piece. Um, you have a question? Yes, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. That's okay. Um, so it sounds like people who might be interested should be like on it right now, trying to get some of these ducks in a row. Yeah. So what we we actually had a meeting with them today, and and we need to we need to to work out our timeline and basically using like our our end con our start of construction and working back from that. So that is what we're working on right now. We're we're thinking that we need to start doing initial marketing seven to nine months before we even start construction to at least get people a little bit more familiar with that financial literacy piece, wealth building. What does that mean? What is a credit score? How do you get there? And so working on getting somebody so that they can qualify for that mortgage when the lottery hits, um, because we want people to have that piece of paper from the bank that says, yes, they can at least qualify for the mortgage in order to even participate in the lottery process. So backing that up and saying, how are we going to get somebody there so that 
when we do the lottery, they're ready to go. And OVI has a lot of modules already in place that they can they can pull from and they've done this before. So um, so that's really exciting. I'm just going to like harp on ARPA one last time. I know I do that a lot, but I'm wondering if there's any way that the remaining ARPA funds that we have in the affordable housing pot, if there's a way to earmark to say we want some of this to be used for down payment assistance. And this is maybe not as much a question to Jessica as a question to either Nate or Greg or um, I guess Dave is gone, but again, plan just, just wondering. <laughs> I think that's a great point. We've often, we brought up at the ZBA process, the reparations assembly, and that they had, uh, they had discussed as one of the reparations um, uh, payouts would be for down payment assistance. Um, and so I don't know what the process is going to be for somebody to prove that they're able to qualify for reparations. I'm not sure if that's actually been figured out yet, but um you know, it would be nice to have that in place for an option for folks who are who are purchasing in this development. So, um, so that's again something to sort of think about. So I'll just um, Jessica, to, yeah, I, yeah, I think ARPA will just we can let staff know um, there might be some funds they have to be encumbered or in an account by the end of this year, this calendar year, and then spent by twenty six, I think, at the latest. We have to do hit some. We have to hit expenditure benchmarks before then, which I don't think will be a problem townwide. I don't know if we have to do it by each category, but um, yeah, we you know between a few different projects, we you know staff has talked about how we could allocate the remaining um, housing money, but between wayfinders and what's already been um, um, kind of allocated and what could happen, say with BFW, there may not be a lot of funds left over. Uh, there could be other ARPA funds, you know, from other areas, you know, buckets or categories. But in terms of the housing piece, there's actually there may not be a lot. But yeah, and I think that's a, a good idea. So it's something I, I'll just, I'll, you know, actually, I'll just get an email started to Dave and put it out there. Erica, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this sounds fantastic in terms of the organizations you're working with and their experience. Um, what are some of the plans in terms of maybe working with the um, African uh, Heritage uh, Reparation Assembly or with the Human Rights Committee or with um, Jennifer Moyston to uh, really get that information out to communities of color here in Amherst? Sure. Great question. So um, my colleague, Twanisha Winbush, who is um, working with us at Valley, she is um, a fellow that is, um, she has been placed with us as a host organization for the, um, for two years. She's been with us for about six months. Um, she's a fellow through the, um, a program through OPCO in Boston, which is for developers of, um, it's affordable housing, equitable development. So it's, it's targeted to increasing, um, people of color within the affordable housing development realm. So she has been placed with us and she has been placed in charge of doing boots on the ground outreach um, for this. So she has already started to compile a database of community um, community areas, black owned businesses. Um, she watched all the recent videos of the um, Black Business Association in Amherst. Um, and so she's starting to put a database together. This is one thing where I think we could use some assistance from members of the community is if you have individuals that you think would be um, worthwhile for us to do some boots on the ground contact with. Another thing that we're actually looking for are community events or cultural events that are being held in communities of color and that we would actually just be there handing out flyers saying, we have this upcoming project or we have these developments or there's this literacy training, um, you know, starting again, we're having these initial conversations with DVM and OVI to sort of figure out what that messaging is and the timeline and all. But that was one thing. Another thing we talked about today is being representing or being at cultural events or community events to hand out information um, and going to people rather than expecting people to come to us. 
So um, again, if there's any cultural events, I mean, I'm aware of the North Amherst barbecue because we attended that for the design aspect. That's, you know, the one community event that I am aware of. It happens in September. But again, like if you've got <laughs> community events that you want us to be aware of or you think it would be great for us to be representing at, um, please pass that information along and I will give it to Tunisia and she will start organizing that boots on the ground messaging with uh, DVM and OVI. So um, so that's part of it. We're also looking outside Amherst. I mean, as you know, there is a local preference that has been um, part of the permit decision here for the seven of the 80% AMI homes. So the rest of the homes are open to anybody who um, is an appropriately sized home, a household for the home is the first tier of uh, marketing priority. And then second is um, anybody living in a qualified census tract. So that is income qualified. So we will be targeting outreach in those qualified census tracts throughout the region as well. Um, so uh, again, any information you might want to pass on to us in terms of people that we should be contacting, that Twanisha should be having individual meetings with, please pass that along. We would love to have that information. That would be super helpful. So I just sent you um, uh, a link to the powwow that's going to happen in May. Um, I think that's going to be really important, especially for um, individuals from the Native American community, which seem to be most underrepresented when it comes yes. to housing. Yes. Um, but I do have some contacts that I'll try to um, get their names um, to you. Uh, and then there's also the Juneteenth um, uh, event that usually happens, which I think is another big one. That's um, awesome. so, yeah. But I think all of us should put our heads together and um, get as many people as we can to uh, send contacts to you that you can do outreach to. That would be great. That would be great. That's awesome. Yeah, that would really be super helpful for us. Um, so that's the marketing piece. Is it, yeah, go ahead, Nate. You have a question? No, I was going to say, we were, we, uh, Greg and I were talking today, and uh, I guess uh, the town manager's office keeps a, a list of events. And oh. so... Um, you know, we could reach out to Angela or Jessica, if you did and copy Greg or myself, but I think they, you know, they're trying to get a, a calendar together for the next few months. And so, you know, like, you know, right. So whether it's school events or community events, there might, there, I, I think there's, I was told that there's a, some list that's being formulated. So. Um, okay. Does that go on like the town's website calendar or something? Is that part of the I think it, that's where it'll end up. I was just looking. Yeah. But I don't see anything that's consolidated and easy to, to okay. look at once. So, so like Angela a, is the point of contact for that's, us. I, I, I'll, that's what I was told, but okay, um, we can look into it too for you. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so that's, I think, it on marketing, unless anybody has any other questions about marketing, lottery, timeline, our partnership, the financial literacy piece. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in that bucket that I should touch on. I think that's about it. Um, so then the other aspect of it that we will be doing here in 2024 is trying to button up our financing. So we've had um, initial pricing from Kiter Builders. They were kind enough to give us, um, to take the permitting plan. So they're not fully you know, full architectural plans, but what we submitted for permitting um, and to do some preliminary cost estimates. The, the cost per square foot is coming in higher than what we had initially budgeted. Um, the range, the low range was 332 a square foot and the high range was 406 a square foot. Um, and we were budgeting at around 329 a square foot. So already we know that there's gonna be a gap in our budget due to construction costs. Um, and that's just a preliminary estimate. This isn't like our final construction number. So. Um, you know, as we start sharpening our pencils, do we need to start value engineering certain things out in, in order to hit our budget? That's not really what we want to do. We feel like we've presented a really wonderful plan that we want to stick to. So, um, you know, one of the first things that would might have to go if we run into budget issues is the solar panels. So, you know, we would intend to wire for them, but we might not have the funding in order to actually install them. So that would be, you know, $360,000 that we could cut out of the budget if we needed to, but that is not ideal, not the way that we want to go. Um, so we're looking at 
different grants or trying to um, find different financing. What makes this a little bit tricky is that Commonwealth Builders in the requirement says you cannot go to HLC for any other funding. You cannot request soft any soft debt funding from, from HLC. It's it's against the, the rules of Commonwealth Builders. So there isn't a lot of matching money that we can really go to. The um, the town has provided a significant amount of money, which is awesome. Um, we, you know, we'll be getting some revenue from sales of the homes, and those home sale prices are going to be set by Mass Housing based on um, where the household income numbers are at the time, where the interest rate numbers are at the time, what we think our condo fees are going to be, what those real numbers are going to be once we start really pricing those out. Um, so. I suspect that we're going to have a gap in our budget that we need to fill. Um, we may be coming back to the trust if if we cannot find that fill that gap in other ways. So I just wanted to sort of lay that groundwork that you may see us coming for a funding request once we really kind of sharpen our pencils and figure out um, and if we're you know able to to tap into other grants and other resources in order to to fill this gap. Um, so that's um, so that's that piece. Um, so we will hopefully be getting, going into a contract with the GC um, within the next couple months. And then we'll start really finalizing that, getting our application into Commonwealth Builders, finalizing that set of funding, um, and hopefully going into financial closing, construction closing, so that we can be shovels in the ground by next spring. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in the, <laughs> in the next several months. Um, but I'm confident that we're going to get there and we're going to do it. It's going to take some, some blood, sweat and tears in order to get there, but all of these projects do. So. Thank you so much, Jessica. Sure. Um, does anybody have any comments, questions, Nate, are you? Yeah, I, I just had a question. How come the square foot is so high? I, I just, is it also because you're trying to get like passive house or I know with the new energy code, there's some things, but, um, seems really high to be honest uh, that's the with... cost of construction i mean that's actually low <laughs> that's, I, yeah, I, we have you know, some the... builds that are coming in at six hundred dollars a square foot so you know it, it, that is the cost of construction these days and we are not really building anything super fancy yes we have all electric utilities but this is a pretty straightforward build but this is the cost of construction this is what it costs so yeah, I, don't, I mean, the building commissioner does, you know, will has projects, and we've talked about it. But you know, I, I was just look, doing some math on a, a spec home right now, and it's like three fifteen a square foot. And so, I don't know. I just is it, you know, does is this also factor in like the site work? I just, I'm, it's yes. just, it's, yes, yeah, it's everything. Yeah, it's just it is. I know it's just really expensive, and so it's hard to say that you know the cost of a twelve hundred square foot home is half a million dollars. Is that that's just. That's the cost yeah. of construction. I mean, and, and if you remember, we had initially kind of come in here thinking we wanted to do some market rate homes in addition to affordable and found that the cost of construction was higher than what the market could support to sell them. So that's why we pivoted and moved to a, a full 100% affordable model. That was not how we started, but that's how the numbers were running. So. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else from anybody? No. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, and congratulations. Sure. Yes. And congratulations to us as well because it's our yes. community that's getting this. And so. thank you for all of your support and all of the letters of support that you wrote and submitted during the permitting process. We did not have one negative letter against the project. We had only, I think we had 18 letters of support. So, um, you know, so that's just awesome. It's really exciting when when that happens. And and we owe a lot to the trust for your support during this process. So you're and great allies. You, yeah, you should also take credit for the amount of groundwork that you've done in the community. Um, it was great to be at that district um, barbecue and see uh, the way you elicited people's input and putting out those little, you know, models. Um, oh, I know. Also that was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. The site <laughs> tour, the site tour was phenomenal. So you really yep. are exemplary in terms of the outreach that you do. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Um, thank great you. Great partnering it with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. All righty. <laughs>
All right, so we're going to move on to Wayfinders, um, Southeast Street and Belchertown Road, um, the state project eligibility determination. Um, they are now uh, in the public comment period. Um, I think the 30 days has already started. Um, Greg, I know you're just about to say something, but uh, I was just going to say one more thing, which is... Um, Two things I'm going to say. One is uh, if you're looking to uh, put in your own comment, you certainly uh, can go on to the um, uh, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust webpage. And thank you, Greg, for putting it up there. And you can put in your own comment. Tonight, we would actually ask, uh, oh, before I move on, I see that Representative Dom has joined us. Um, and we're going to, we can put this aside for a second, and we're going to ask Representative Dom, who was kind enough to come here and join us. Um, we had asked uh, if she could give us um, some updates about what she thought were important uh, legislative bills coming up and how we could support uh, any of the legislation that she thinks is is really important for us to, to know about. So I'm going to stop there and move to item number six to allow her to come and speak because she's on a very, very tight timeline. Um, so move her into our panel. Thank you, Representative Dom. Oh, I'm I'm like so honored that you've said this, but I've, Greg, I'm so sorry I'm cutting the line. Um, thank you for letting me do that. Erica, thank you so much for bringing me in. I've just been going from one place to another. And as you know, Grace Simmons on my team is here and they'll be able to sort of fill you in. I think there were specific bills that you wanted to know about that Grace is prepared to also share brief comments on. I wanted to give you a sense of what's happening right now um, in terms of timeliness so that um, you get a sense of not just what you may want to weigh in on, but how quickly you may want to do that. So as you may know, Wednesday, um, the House budget was released and it is a total of 57.9 billion with a B um, dollars. And I just want to remind everybody that this budget is happening in a financial climate uh, for Massachusetts of relative uncertainty. And the thing that we're certain of is not so great. So I actually prefer uncertainty um, than being told that um, we're living, that the budget is going to have to be very restricted because we have not done what we thought we'd do in terms of generating revenue. So let me just step back for a moment. For about four or five years consecutively, we've had budgets that have exceeded what the budget makers thought were going to be our goals. And when those goals in budget speak are called benchmarks. And so for the past couple of years, we've exceeded those benchmarks. The economy has been very good. We've brought in more revenue than they thought we would. And what they thought we would when they created those benchmarks, that's what the budget was based on. So we've always had sort of excess and an ability to be probably a little bit more generous than we later in the fiscal year than we would be in the beginning. However, in the past seven months, Massachusetts has not made its revenue benchmarks. That doesn't mean we're not collecting revenue. We are. It just means that the benchmarks or the goals that we set were a little bit too ambitious, ambitious for the actual economy that we're in. And so we've missed the benchmarks. Wouldn't be such a big deal, except that meant that our budget that was created for FY24 was based on benchmarks that we didn't reach. And so some of you may know that about two months ago, I think, the governor implemented nine C cuts, which if you're in a nonprofit or in government, and Erica's shaking her head, that sends, sends like goosebumps down your spine because what that means is a mid-year budget cut. And it's basically because we're not sure if we're going to get enough revenue to finish the year. Unlike the federal government, we have to have a balanced budget and we don't make the money. People have said, have sort of said things to me that make me think that maybe they think that Massachusetts does print their own money. We don't. Only the U.S. government does that. So we have certain benchmarks that have been set now for FY25, which is the next budget year. They're not as ambitious as they've been in the past. Um, they recognize that we're bringing in revenue. Our economy is okay, but we just have to be a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, more realistic 
with what we're going to do in terms of revenue. And so, excuse me, I just want to pick something up that's important for this presentation. Um, and so Wednesday, the House, the House always goes first with money matters. <clears throat> so Wednesday, the House budget came out, and this is after months of public hearings, advocacy meetings, like I've been meeting with the chairman of Ways and Means, other people have. So they create a budget. And we have till tomorrow to submit amendments to that budget. That means if there's things we want changed or added into the budget. I suppose there might also be amendments to delete things from the budget or to modify things in a way that restrict it. That's not usually what I do, but like, for example, I'd be concerned about potential amendments that limit certain state services only to US citizens, for example. That would be sort of a way to amend the budget to deny a service or to take away a service. And the a person who may introduce that may have a lot of reasons to introduce that. And one of it may be to save money at this point, quite frankly. Um, but we have until tomorrow. So we have basically 48 hours to submit amendments. And those amendments can be programmatic, money-wise for programs or local investments, otherwise known as earmarks. And there's also a part of the budget that's called an outside section, which is policy. Um, and so the housing part of this budget is actually more generous than I thought it was going to be because I thought we have the housing bond coming through too, that maybe a lot of housing pieces would be shifted to the bond. But what I see in this budget is that housing benefits are in this budget. And I'm, um, I'm thinking that the bond is going to focus a lot more on production and the big ticket items like what Nate was talking about in terms of the high cost of construction and what we heard from Valley CDC, that's what you need a big bond for. So I think that's going to be the bond. Just in terms of timing, though, the next week, the House Ways and Means Committee will organize all the amendments that come in um, into, sec into categories. And then the following week, the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the House will meet to debate and discuss the budget and to pass a budget. And we will pass a budget. It's not like, will we do it? Will we not do it? I've been there for five years. We always pass a budget. And we pass it on time, at least our part, maybe not necessarily the part that's for the whole state, but getting our part done so we can give it to the Senate happens on time. When we're done, it goes to the Senate and they do their thing with the budget at the end of May. So about a month later, they pretty much go through a similar process, not exactly, but similar, but they end up with their Senate budget. You can imagine it'll look different than the House, and I'm gonna explain why in a moment. And then it'll go into conference. There'll be a conference committee that will have to come up with a unified budget that both bodies can agree on. When that happens, we vote on it, it goes to the governor. She gets to either approve it, veto it, or veto certain parts of it. If she vetoes certain parts of it, we still have an opportunity to consider overriding and passing our budget. Now, I suspect that the Senate budget is usually actually a little bit more um, robust than the House one, only because it since it happens after the House one, we generally know that we have more, in the past five years, we've known we've had more money by the time the Senate gets to it and they can use that money in meeting people's needs. This year, um, that may happen, and it's compounded by the fact that the House may be a little bit more cautious. So we may see an interesting budget happen in May. That's the budget. So that's going to be services, benefits. Some of the things that are in the budget might be like money for the emergency assistance shelter system, which I'm sure you've talked about. It's a huge um, issue, not only with Massachusetts residents, but with migrants in the state. And we've made a commitment to make sure that folks get housed. So that's a very big piece of money. Um, the MRVP program is in there for vouchers. The raft program is in there. Home base is in there. Shelter workforce assistance, which is something that was not in the governor's budget, is in our budget at a price tag of $10 million, which I think is terrific. The other thing that's in our budget that I really want to sort of be excited about is we fund a pilot program for the right to legal counsel in evictions. And this has been one of the priorities for me being in the um, state. If you may know that the governor put it as a policy in her housing bond 
but without a price tag. But there is a price tag to it if you're going to implement it. In the House budget, it's in there at about, I think, $2.5 million for a pilot program. Um, and so that's fantastic because we're going to learn from the pilot program that it has to be made permanent. I'm I'm pretty convinced. That's one piece. Then there's the housing bond that you've heard about. And what I've said is I think that's going to be about, about production and very um, likely that could come before the House of Representatives by in the middle of May sometime. I mean, it could be in June, but I'm hearing chatter that it may be in May, which makes some sense because since it's a money bill, it would come to the House first. And that would allow like the housing bond, then the Senate budget, and then the Senate deal with the housing bond. Um, and obviously we want that to pass before the end of the fiscal year so that we can have it in place for the next. So that's to give you a sense of timing. And so if you're looking for support for amendments to the budget, you should let me know next week because it should happen before we actually have debate so that I can look at it, consider it. If I'm not already a co-sponsor of those amendments, become a co-sponsor or somehow indicate my support for them. If you're thinking about the bond, you've got some time. And so I kind of want you to relax about that. Um, it went through the housing committee and it's in the bonding committee. But whatever is happening in those committees, it's still in it's still in flux. It's still fluid. And the same people who would be putting the finishing touches on a housing bond have to deal with the budget first. So there's a little bit of breathing room in there. And I think I'll stop. I know that Grace is also on the phone. I'm sorry, I took a little bit longer than I thought I would, which is always the case because I like to talk. That's just the way it is. Um, but Grace has also prepared to give you some information on the specific bills that you asked about. So I'd like to, if you have any questions about timing, I'm here. Otherwise, I'd like to hand it off to Grace. I don't see any hands up. So I think I think that was a lot to take in, which was very, very useful, Representative Dom. Um, no, no, it, no, we need to understand that. Um, and, uh, you know, having worked for the state, it's always been, the spring has always been sort of like uh fire drill around the budgets. Um, but it's also a real opportunity for us as trust members to think about how we can help you um, either, you know, around amendments or just supporting the, you know, the amendments that you're putting through. So thank you for giving us this information. It's really important. Yeah, we get the, you know, we get information from the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness and the Western Mass Housing Coalition. Those are pretty much like the amendments that I'll probably be looking through. Grace is probably going to be talking about some of them. Um, but when it comes to the housing bond, I just want to kind of raise a flag that I'm really going to want to know what your priorities are, because it is really a bunch of stuff, right? There's production, there's paying attention to housing authorities, which I really want to look at, like, what are we doing about maintenance and getting those empty units filled with people? Um, there's renovation, there's decarbonization. So I think I really, I, um, whatever we can do to also support you to support me in identifying what your uh, priorities are, I would love I would love to be engaged in that conversation. Thank you, and maybe with our process for our own goal setting, that will help us to define more specific areas that we can then share with you that we think are priorities. So that would be terrific. Thank you all for all for your great work. I mean, really, Amherst is just hitting it out of the park in terms of affordable housing and. All of you are a huge part of that, like the largest part of that. And only through our partnership with people like you. So thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> I see Grace is on. So if you want, yes. they can provide you with a, a, the specific information that you asked for. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you very much, Representative Dom, because we know how busy you are. So thank, thank you, you, everybody. I hope I, I'll, I'll try and stop by next month, too. Great. Thank you. And Greg, thank you for letting me cut the line. Grace, Erica Grace, and Carol are in charge. <laughs> Grace, thank you so much for being here and for presenting this information. Of course, happy and excited too. So, um, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. All right, I'm we can hear you. Like yep. straight that up. All right. So, um, I know that the bills that you were specifically um, looking to talk about tonight were uh, the right to counsel counsel and eviction proceedings. That's um, it was H1731 and S8 
six four, um, but it was um, it is now H four three six zero after it was um, reported favorably out of the Judiciary Committee. Um, it was reported out as a redraft, which is essentially a favorable report. Um, and on the twelfth of February, it was reported to House Ways and Means, meaning it's just waiting to be brought to the floor for a debate and vote once the ball gets rolling on that. Um, for the foreclosure prevention program, which is H942 and S653, um, the status of that is that one was sent to a study in February on the 7th from the Committee on Financial Services. Um, but the other two that we still have yet to hear about are the uh, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, or TOPA H1350 and S880. And um, that was, the reporting date for that one was extended to actually just tomorrow. So that one actually might be out. Probably not yet, not 100% sure. I can double check on that and get that information to you. And same with the Rent Control Enabling Act uh, that was also extended to the 12th. Not sure why they extended it to a Saturday though. So I can definitely double check to see if those have been reported out. I wrote this up um, a day or two ago, but um, yeah. And then just to provide a few more details about the budget highlights um, that Rep. Don was talking about, um, the House version of the budget, um, the bill number for that is H6000. Um, so if you're looking to look at the text of that, you can uh, easily find it on the Massachusetts legislature website, but it's definitely a lot to go through. So I wouldn't blame you if you didn't want to file through the entire thing. Um, and if you do go to the documents, one of the, um, one of the documents included in the bill is kind of a summary rather than having to read through every line item. So that could be a more easily digestible way to kind of sit down with it a little longer. And I'm also more than happy to send that all to you um, if that's easier. And um, so the highlights for emergency shelter, um, it was 500 million, and that is mostly situated in line item 7004011. Um, I can also send all these line items over. Um, and there's some other funding for that scattered around um, within the budget. Um, 197 million for raft, which was an increase from 190 million in um, FY24. Um, 119 million for MRVP, 2.5 million for the uh, Access to Council program. And yeah, as the rep said, the um, through tomorrow we'll be filing all the amendments and uh, going through all those. So if you have any follow up questions about the budget. Um, Next week, uh, we have some downtime to kind of look through all of the amendments, process those, get ready for um, the actual budget debate week. And yeah, I'm more than happy to get as many details or answer any questions about the budget um, in that time. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, I don't see any hands up, so I think everyone is Good with that, but if you can send me that information, we'll uh, Carol and I and Greg will pass it along to everyone else so they can take a look at it. Definitely will do. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for always attending our meetings. Of course, I've come to enjoy them. Lots of interesting stuff. <laughs> Thanks. All right, so we're going to move back to uh, item number four uh, on wayfinders. Um, I think Greg, you were just about to say something. And if you can't remember what you um, said, I can continue. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was just going to let you know that Representative Dome had appeared in the uh, in the attendee group there, um, and to go to her, but uh, you caught it, which is great. Um, um, yeah, so I can give a uh, so we heard from about this, about uh, uh, Cameras Community Homes. Um, the sort of wonky update on the Wayfinders process I actually have a brand new wrinkle, which is fun. So I, I think I will share if I could. Um, so. And I forget uh, who's received which communications, but where that project is right now is they have formally uh, requested from the state um, a project eligibility determination. So the state does a 30 day review um, uh, of basically, you know, is this project conceptually viable 
they'll they'll do a much more formal review when they actually apply for funding way down the line. That won't happen until the ZBA approves it locally. So, but as a part of that initial process, which is ultimately a state or Commonwealth led process, uh, the, the, the town and, you know, and town bodies like ours, as well as um, individual members of the public are empowered to, uh, to, to make public comment on the, the conceptual idea of, of the project. And that is in place to communicate to the state because this is going through the 40B process. In some communities, that's a very contentious process. And this is a window for, you know, for folks to be on the record. Um, in this case, this is a friendly 40B. So we're using the mechanism because it's efficient, uh, but it's not a contentious relationship. Obviously, we're a town body and we funded this project. Um, the thing I want to reflect is that we, uh, so we, we are, we do have an obligation to um, solicit feedback from the public. We don't need to hit a ceiling, um, but we do want to demonstrate that we've let the public know that, you know, they have an opportunity to weigh into the state in this period. We were a little bit nervous about the number of comments that we had, um, um, but both Nate and I kind of wondered if perhaps uh, this is just not a contentious question. And uh, for a variety of reasons, um, I think probably uh, both the movement of um, uh, the, the sites aren't quite as prominent as others that we've had. It's family housing, which is maybe a little more palatable to some folks. Um, and also that uh, that the national conversation around housing has shifted a great deal and folks are supportive. Um, the thing I want to report is, you know, despite that, we want to make sure we had some comments. So we did a little news item via the notify mechanism in the website this afternoon. Maybe some of you received that. I don't know. But uh, I did a... Um, perhaps some of these are your all of your comments but we just did a quick thing and there's an option there to say do you want to push this to the people who subscribe so it goes to their phones or to their email or to their text messages and in a, a period of a few hours we got uh several comments um all, all of all of them are positive i just looked um so um point being there's it seems like a, a strong positive appetite for this um so with that said we can talk about the trust um submitting a memo in support um i know at least uh, one member already has done that individually, um, but if uh, it, it'd probably be good if uh, we cover that. I don't know, Erica, if you want to lead that or um, yes, yeah. yes. So thank you, Greg. Um, I think it would be a really good idea if um, uh, the trust members agreed if uh, Carol and I could submit a memo to Paul that we feel that this is a really important project um, and that we support it. Um, I did look at the planning board memo. Uh, the planning board uh, has um, stated that they support it, but they have a lot of comments that make me very nervous, um, which, you know, it may seem like they're barriers to actually getting this project done. So I think, you know, it would be good uh, for the state, because my understanding is that the memos will be submitted, um, that, you know, that we can include a memo from our group saying um, that, you know, this is a project that's going to move forward. There is um, absolute um, support for it. It's a partnership between the trust and the town uh, and Wayfinders. Uh, Wayfinders has a lot of uh, great experience and that whatever the planning board has put up with regard to specifics will be ironed out uh, through the process. So I'm hoping that um, everyone will be okay with Carol and I uh, going through and submitting a memo to Paul uh, stating that. Or is there anybody who has any concerns about that? But maybe what I should do is let Allegra speak first and then I'll ask again. Go ahead, Allegra. Um, so I, A, I was raising my hand to make a motion in case we needed to be formal about it. But if we don't need to be formal, I don't need to make a motion. But um, I guess just to kind of talk for a second about what the planning board said, because basically one of their big concerns is the setback from the street, right? That they had placed the the housing is kind of in front and then the parking is i don't know behind or whatever which was actually the opposite of what the original plan i feel like had been like way 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 back and then there was conversation about well we want it to be not a shopping mall we want it to be a you know a, a village center but then yeah so regardless i think that you know if if that's going to be a barrier, I would just hope that if they have to flip flop it, that wouldn't change the number of units that we could get. Because I think if if being because if being closer to the road gets us more units, 
that's the most important thing, I think. Um, although I do, again, I, I preferred the original plan because I have small children. So if it's a family housing, I'd be worried about having like children that close to the road. That's a busy road. So there are some safety concerns that I just, you know, worry me a little bit, but I'm not the planning board. So, <laughs> um, but do you want me to make a motion or, or are we good just being informal? Um, um I, I think we're okay if we can agree if there's anybody who disagrees uh in uh, allowing um carol and i to submit a letter of a memo of support to the town manager regarding the support of this project not seeing any i think we can go ahead and move forward with doing that uh and my understanding is um allegra what you raise are really important uh concerns but my understanding is is that when the zoning board looks at this this is when those particular specific issues actually come um so it's interesting that you know it's great that the planning board is very concerned but um it would seem that it's sort of premature in them putting all of this uh, maybe they wanted to document it but it just almost seems like there's so many concerns that would then make me feel concerned that the state's going to say wow, there's lots of concerns here um, versus that the zoning board will take this up and we can also make recommendations as well um, to the zoning board. Okay, I think, unless I don't hear uh, that being negated by, I assume that is the case. So we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, and then we'll share with all of you what we've come up with uh, once we, we put it together and send it to Paul. Nate, Nate has his hand up. Oh, sorry, Nate, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks. I was going to say what uh, Erica, you know, you had mentioned that the planning board, uh, you know, voiced support for it. And then they, you know, became a little more critical of the design and, you know, parking ratios and other things. And I think that's fine. Um, and they also said that could it be, you know, could each site have additional floor on the building and actually have more units and be denser. And so that may have been lost in their memo. And Right. I think the state will be comfortable with it, but I think, you know, Greg and I had said it would be great to have a memo from the trust saying that, right, all those uh, comments or concerns could be addressed when it actually gets to the ZBA and that, you know, there is strong support for it from the trust. And, and, and you know, and uh, we could even say that the planning board supported the concept as well. So in this, this phase of the permit, this is kind of like a pre-permit review by the state. They look at, is the site generally developable? Is the concept plan you know, generally appropriate? Is their budget feasible? You know, do they have site control? You know, so a few other, and a number of things, but, you know, the planning board said yes quickly to all that and then just jumped right in and talked about other things that I think the state would be say, would also say what they've done in the past. There are comments like this before. They would just say, well, these comments are more appropriately addressed to the ZBA. And then just say, they would ask actually that the town just forward all these comments onto the ZBA. But I think it would be helpful to have a memo from the trust just because, you know, it, it you know it can only help, right? Um, and as Greg mentioned, we had Wayfinders had a forum, you know, about a month ago, and not many people came. They did notice the abutters, you know, it was just like a legal notice. They uh, sent a mail a mailing out to all properties within three hundred feet of both sites. They put signs up on the sites. Uh, we had information in the schools, uh, in the school, and you know, and it there just there hasn't been a lot of um, um, opposition. Everything seems positive. The neighbors of the sites have written letters in support, which is great. You know, I do think that Valley has done a really nice job with their two previous comprehensive permit projects. And so, you know, I think that the community might be getting more comfortable with them as, to, as well as Greg mentioned. So there's you know, probably a number of reasons why that this is, you know, going, um, you know, I, I don't want to jinx it, but, you know, going well right now. Uh, and maybe it says that in the future, things will be just as smooth. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that, yeah, the planning board comments aren't really going to derail this. I mean, it's interesting, the chair of the planning board and someone else said, yeah, let's just put a, another story on both sites. Like, if we need housing and you have 30 units at Southeast Street, why not put another floor on and add 10 or 15 more units? And it's like, wow, okay. But at the same time, great. But, you know, I'm like, you know. So actually I met with Wayfinders twice since that meeting just last week and we have another meeting tomorrow morning about it, trying to figure out how to address that and could they modify it a little bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I, I actually think it'll be, I think it's worthwhile to be honest. I actually find that the design of Belchertown Road isn't the best. 
And so I think the comments, you know, um, it was the first time the planning board saw it. So, you know, they really just jumped right in, which I think is great actually, because it, I think what it'll do is it actually prepare wayfinders for when it gets to permitting. Um, and so, you know, I've actually asked that to be forwarded to the conservation commission, the historical commissions looked at it, you know, you have a memo, the commission was fine with it. And so, you know, I, I think it's great. It's getting out there. And by the time it hopefully it comes to the ZBA, it's like all those things have been worked out and really it's just now it'll be, uh, you know, have to go through the permitting, but there'll be no surprises. Thank you, Nate. And I'm also paying attention to the time. It's 8.59. We still have one topic that uh, I believe is a little bit important. So I'm hoping that people can stay. Um, is there anybody who needs to leave exactly at nine? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, so we're going to, oh, Allegra, you are? Well, we still can uh, no, okay, <laughs> you, you're mute, so I wasn't sure what you said. Okay, so I'm just going to ask um, Nate to, it, could you briefly give us a, a sense of the planning board's conversation of the overlay and what you think we as the trust could do to help this conversation? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if trust members have seen some of the information or followed it, but, you know, starting many months ago at the planning board, we talked about having an overlay on University Drive, the section between Amity Street and Route 9. So, you know, where, um, you know, just that stretch, you know, properties on both sides of the road. At first, maybe it would go south of Route 9, but really it's just those properties kind of where the old rafters is and, you know, like Athena's Pizza and the post office and then the medical buildings across the street. And, um, you know, the idea was, could this be student housing? You know, I think I said something like 2,000 beds down there and really have a dense area following the university town gown report where, you know, there could be students close to university and not impact a lot of neighbors. The planning board liked the idea of having in, uh, an overlay and infill there. And since then, you know, it's, it's been modified. They don't like the idea of having apartments. They want um, most buildings to be mixed use. They're worried about the loss of commercial retail space. Uh, they don't really want it to restrict it to students or, you know, or you know, they want it to be open for everyone. Uh, and they're worried about density and some other things. You know, it's not that it's a, it's not a bad thing that they have those concerns. At the same time, you know, when they were looking at 4555 South Pleasant Street just the other night, you know, there's 22 units. They're worried that all those units are going to become students. And so I said, well, you know, we're not going to ha have an impact if every time there's a 10 unit development and we don't want to have students live there, but we're not willing to have a place where we could say, let's put a lot of students. And so you know, from the trust perspective, uh, you know, the purpose of the of the bylaw or the overlay, you know, I think I'd said it could be housing and economic development or housing opportunities and expanded economic development or something. And that's some other pieces. But yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, I just want to keep the trust aware of the conversation. And, you know, if, you know, if at some point you'd want to have a memo to the planning board saying like, you know, and we it's late tonight, so it could even happen next month. The planning board hasn't really talked about it since February. They're going to pick it up in May. Um, again, just because they've had other things to do, but, you know, some members, um, you know, aren't, you know, I think the idea generally they support it, but then, you know, the details are getting worked out. But to me, it's like, if it loses what could be an impactful overlay, you know, is it time to have the trust weigh in or have other opinions to help guide them? Because, you know, really we do need like a, a big magnitude of housing to help balance some of the you know, the pressures and demands. And, you know, for instance, with University Drive or with the South Pleasant Street project, they're saying, well, if it's 85% students or more, let's require that they have, you know, a live-in manager and extra, you know, measures to keep the students safe and whatever. And, Thanks. and it's like, well, you know, at, you know, how do we measure that? And, you know, there's a big discussion about that. Um, but it's like, okay, we can't we can't be trying to address this on a project by project basis. I think that you know we have to almost step back and say, okay, if we think we need three thousand beds for students, you know, could you know Amherst could the university could have the what are what are some mechanisms to do that? And I think you know the university town gown, you know, it was like a year long effort identified University Drive as an area where there could be pretty dense housing, and so um, you know Barry Roberts applied for a variance from the ZBA, and I don't know if, you, if there's an article in the Gazette on the corner of University and Amity. Uh, it was like 80, almost 90 units, 230 beds, mixed use, you know, really nice. Essentially that project 
that received a variance wouldn't be allowed in the overlay. And so it's like, okay, so if the overlay is now not achieving what, I don't know, what I wanted, <laughs> but maybe what would actually be impactful is it, you know, does the planning board need some outside perspective? And so that's where I, you know, I came, you know, that's kind of, was kind of the discussion to the housing trust. It's late, but maybe we could pick it up next month and we could send more information uh, to you. I just, you know, and I get it. We want to be careful of the design and I, you know, we don't want to zone out the possibility of non-residential space. Um, at the same time, we've had an, a research and development overlay there for a few decades and it really hasn't been used. Uh, you know, the idea of an overlay is that all the existing zoning stays in place. I know it's another layer of zoning, but it's an optional one that you can use. You don't have to use it. But if, you know, it was allowed enough density or it was, you know, worthwhile, someone might. So like right now, um, you know, the way it's zoned, you get limited units on the property because of additional lot area and some other requirements. And so, you know, for instance, someone could come say like, oh, I'd like to redevelop where um, the Hampshire bike exchange is and the zoning might allow 30 units. And it's like, OK, or if we had an overlay and you could get 80 units there, you know, it, is, is this an appropriate place for it? And, you know, I, I, th I think it is, you know, it's not, you know, to me, it's, you know, it's relationship to the university, to transportation, to other roads, to neighborhoods. It makes a lot of sense as opposed to you know, we're looking at maybe rezoning East Amherst. And I think East Amherst is a place for density, but do you really want to have a lot of students in East Amherst that are then commuting through town when, you know, you could have them closer to the university? Anyways, it's just something I want the trust to be aware of. And, you know, the planning board is having this discussion as well, but it seems like they're kind of leaning toward, you know, only allowing mixed-use buildings, no apartments, um, and, you know, some question about what's, what's the kind of appropriate density. Um, Gaston, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, I mean, maybe you also all made the connection. This is exactly the kind of thing that if we get our view together to ask Dave to bring to the UMass conversations, um, I, I guess I don't see an issue with first floor retail. You can still have as many apartments going up from there. So that that doesn't that doesn't cause me any concern if that's what mixed use means, but I, I, I wonder why it raises a concern for you, Nate. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, and it doesn't, it doesn't, I think at one point they wanted a hundred percent of the ground floor of every building. So all the ground floor cannot be residential. And, you know, so what I see happening is one is that people build buildings and they, they, they just don't fill them because they're, they don't need to. Or it is such a high requirement that it doesn't actually get used, the overlay wouldn't get used. And so I think their concern is that, you know, maybe the first few buildings, the first floor wouldn't be occupied because there isn't a, the density there. But eventually you're going to, you might need or want that space. But if you, the market is so strong for residential that if you don't require some non residential space, it just won't get built and you won't have the opportunity then to backfill it in. And so I think that's their concern. I think they're now maybe at 50% ground floor, but 100% of the street facings um, to be non-residential. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with it, except that say in Barry's project that was proposed that received the variance, he, th that project wouldn't even meet these standards. And so it's it's to me, it's like, well, what are the nuances to get something um, permitted? You know, like what, you know, if it's so rigid that it doesn't allow it, is it that, you know, maybe there is some, a little more flexibility that we could discuss. And so I don't necessarily have a problem with mixed use buildings, right? Um, but it's just that, you know, if, if we're, if that's the only thing that we'd allow and then it doesn't really get what you, what you'd want, um, you know. So I think because of time, um, I'll just from my perspective, what you guys, uh, you and Greg put together for us to think about payment and lieu was so uh, helpful in terms of pros and cons. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can do something like that with regards to exactly the overlay or not having an overlay. Um, I, but it was so very helpful in terms of having a conversation to be able to think through what those pros and cons were. Uh, and since we don't have a lot of time right now, it might be useful for our May conversation. And I think this is really important. I mean, the thing that comes up in my mind is at the North Apartments, they do have mixed use and they're still 
absolutely trying to get people, retailers in there. So, you know, um, the, the demand seems for more residential spaces versus retail, especially in a climate of where everyone's using, unfortunately, Amazon. Um, so I think, you know, that that is also something to consider when you think about this having mixed use or having a requirement for mixed use when, um, you know, it's really such a challenge to get retailers to come in when, you know, people are using online versus walking into places. But anyways, I think the conversation is, is really important. Um, so I think if you could possibly do that for us uh, for next time, we'll put it on the agenda because I think it's really important for us to be involved in areas where we can reduce barriers or at least recommend to reduce barriers for development. And it seems like some of these things are becoming barriers to development. Okay, um, so since we're 909, um, uh, very quick, oh, go ahead, who's that? I just want to say, I think what you just said is a really good idea, but maybe it won't happen at our next meeting because we already have so many things. And so maybe they could have a little more time and do it in June or something. That's my only suggestion. Okay, um, it seems like maybe the conversation is, is not so urgent with the planning board, or I think the other thing that Carol and I said to you, Nate, was is that if they're having a conversation about the overlay and you want us to be there and to in person make our public comments, we can do that as well, um, you know, as, as an individual who lives in Amherst. Um, I think if we're doing it for the trust, then we have to make sure that um, the trustees let us uh, speak on behalf of the trust. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll think about... Um, uh, when we can have a fuller conversation about this in terms of our next meetings. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I think we've already talked about the announcement on May 9th. We're going to have uh, two major conversations. One is the strategic planning. The other one's going to be the um, AHRA presentation. So that's going to take up most of the trust meeting. Um, uh, there is only one public person here. Thank you, Grace, for staying. And Grace has already submitted her comments. So I'm not going to open it up for public comments. Um, I don't think there, I'm not going to ask for any items not anticipated within 48 hours because we just don't have time. And I'm just going to state that our next full MHT meeting is on May 9th. Uh, and the Zoom link is always available through um, the town website. So unless there's anything burning, I'm going to go ahead and close the meeting, but Greg? Just let us know if you want to come next Wednesday to Boston or Quincy for Father Bills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, either come next Wednesday or also give us questions to bring with us if you cannot come. All right. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that we went over, but I think this were all, all these conversations were really important. Um, we will see you either at next Wednesday or next Thursday at our small group meeting or at the next trust meeting, which is May 9th. So thank you very much. Okay. You're on mute. Same, same great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Good night. And I'm sorry we kept right. you over. Oh, it's All okay. Right. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye.